Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone who joined us today. Super excited for this. Uh, my name is Hila. I'm currently an uh, executive in residence at Reforge. I'm also a growth advisor. Um, so prior to this, I was the uh, director of growth at GitLab, where I helped them set up the product-led growth motion. I was also VP of growth at a company called Acorns before, and the first uh, pro PM growth at growthhackers.com. I also wrote a book in growth. It's in China. Chinese, unfortunately. So if you uh, do not know Chinese, you can read it, but, but I assure you it exists in reality. Uh, now let's uh, kind of welcome Lauren as well. Lauren, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. I unfortunately have not read Hila's book because I do not speak Chinese, but I am a big fan. So really excited that we're spending some time together today. Uh, I currently am the head of growth at Airtable. I formerly worked as a product growth lead at Meta and also in growth and analytics at Blue Bottle Coffee on the e-commerce business and also early in growth at Dropbox. Uh, on the side, I do advising and angel investing for companies that are sorting through PLG and figuring out how to grow. Uh, so really excited to cover some of the hot takes and fun knowledge that we've accumulated together in working with startups in, in our time today. Yeah, awesome. And um, with that, let me stop sharing of my screen and we'll enter into today's session. So today's session will be a, a fireside chat between Lauren and myself on PLG. And also we'll open to the audience for Q&A in the second half of the session. And if you see there's a Q&A button in Zoom, you're welcome to ask your question, submit your questions through the Q&A. And you can also upload others' questions and we'll try to get them, get to those questions towards the second half of the session. Um, but kind of to get started, uh, as Lauren said, we, we are both actually growth nerds. We love talking about growth. Um, how would you define PLG? If like we are thinking PLG is today's topic, right? Um, one question people ask me, like, Hila, what is product-led growth? How would you define PLG? In my mind, um, product-led growth in B2B context is really about um, how to use product as a lever to grow, right? Use a product not only as a set of features to solve customer problem, but also it become a distribution channel. It become a way to um, reach to users activate users, convert users, retain users. Um, so it become a DTM motion on its own. And in my mind, it's really in contrast with the traditional sales-led motion, right? In B2B, we all know the traditional sales funnel works something like um, you have marketing team working on getting awareness, getting leads, and you nurture them into something called marketing qualified leads and sales team Get, get them, work on them, eventually turn them into contracts and revenue. Uh, but PLG in this context, in B2B context, is really about um, you still need marketing team to work on that top of funnel, getting visitors and maybe getting signups uh, or free users, free trials. And rather than using marketing to nurture the leads, you use the product to be the vehicle to uh, attract the users nurture the usage and through that usage you activate them eventually they may become a kind of uh, in love of your product they just buy on your on their own right self-service to to the revenue or they become something called product qualified leads and that fo follow a similar route of uh, hand it over to sales team and sales team work on them and close them into revenue so I think that's the biggest difference between like product-led growth and sales-led growth. Like Lauren, anything you want to add there? No, I think that was well said. Um, there are of course pros and cons to a product-led growth motion versus a sales-led motion. Um, one thing that comes to mind, and then I'd love to hear if you, let, if you have any others, is that product-led growth can be very efficient because you don't need to hire a human team to um, you know, assist and coach and train and close and, and sign up those customers every time. And you can let the product do a lot of that harvesting and onboarding and helping teams get started. Um, but of course, uh, PLG is not necessarily for everyone. Are there any pros and cons related to a sales-led motion that, that come to mind to you? Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, interestingly, um, at GitLab, my previous company, we actually started, we have all the components to be PLG. We have 
freemium, we have free tier, a uh, free trial. We also have an open source version of the product. But um, we have a sales team from the very beginning. And that sales team is fundamental in terms of helping us uh, secure the bigger deals, right? Working with enterprise customers. And that build a really solid foundation in terms of how to um, kind of just build that foundation of revenue and give the business the, the, the foundation to grow on top of that. So I think one thing definitely that came into mind is that a sales-led motion it's much easier to get those bigger deals, to sell to those enterprise customers, even though it takes longer, but you're playing not a volume game, you're playing a big revenue game. But the product that grows uh, inherently, it's more suited to smaller customers and maybe smaller deals initially. There are ways to work them up eventually, but it's, a, it's kind of a very different, um, potentially different target consumers uh, in a way. And the other thing I would add is in order to make product-led growth work, you need a lot of foundations. And some B2B companies may not have that from the very beginning, like the data foundation, experimentation infra infrastructure, and, and all of that. So kind of that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, I'm curious, like based on your experience, Lauren, do you feel like PLG is a fit for every company, every B2B business, SaaS business, or, or not really? It's a very good question. I think uh, I think it depends. The short answer is no, not every business should use PLG, though probably there are some out there that could be leveraging PLG in their approach to go to market and aren't. So some things that I would think about to determine if your product is a good fit for PLG. First would be, is your product capable of offering a product-led motion or experience? So in some cases, it's just so complicated or technically impossible to get started without actually working with uh, the human teams employed by the company um, or the access to data that's needed for someone to actually get your product up and running requires a vendor management review process, procurement, and sort of going through IT, maybe security review. And it actually takes a while for someone to start using your B2B product before you know they can actually get to value. So the first question I would ask is, is it possible? Will my users be capable of getting started in a product-led way? Uh, the second thing I would think about is, let's say that it is technically possible and that um, your product is capable of offering that. Um, is it going to be easy enough to get started in a product-led way? And that is a question that I think is worth brainstorming on with your team if you're curious about PLG, because it will probably require building your product differently in that yeah. you will need to let somebody get started, set things up, and maybe just learn the basics all on their own. And that requires more of a focus on onboarding and also really simplifying the first couple of things that a customer will do after they give your product a try or, or after they sign up. You might even need to build a sign up flow if you don't have one yet. Um, beyond that, I think then it's really up to how you want to go about go to market. Um, do you feel like there are, to your point, Gila, certain customer segments or profiles that are best suited to a PLG motion? And there is that rule of thumb that you alluded to of smaller companies or smaller, co smaller use cases with smaller teams may be better suited to PLG because they might be able to get what they need out of that simpler use case. Um, but also you might have some, some interest in generating revenue in that self-serve way or with that product-led growth motion down the road without necessarily asking every customer to talk to sales. And that's not necessarily essential when you're building out PLG, but something to think about is where you want your product to go over the next three or five years. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one thing I will add is, a lot of cases when I'm observing the new waves of PLG companies, why they are emerging is because they are trying to disrupt incumbents. Like this category is dominant by incumbents. Think about, let's say Adobe, um, like a new player like Figma, if they want to disrupt incumbents, like PLG motion is a natural way for them to do that because otherwise it's very hard for you to um, challenge the incumbents in an established category. But PLG, the freemium kind of all those new approach gave you a chance to do that. So that's another way kind of to think about there. Um, Awesome. So like 
let's dive into maybe one of the questions I get asked a lot. Um, Lauren, do you want to share like the first question? Yes, I know this is something that you and I have chatted about before. So I'm excited for you to share your knowledge with the rest of the group. But I'm wondering if a B2B company has historically been sales led and is considering PLG sometime later, where should they get started? And what are some of the challenges that that company should expect to face? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's definitely a question I think a lot. Um, so I think one of the big first thing to think about is where what is your starting point? By starting point, I mean companies starting at different places. For example, at GitLab, as I mentioned, GitLab actually started as a P, uh, sales-led motion and we added PLG, we systemized PLG later on. But luckily for, for me, for the team, we have all the components. We have a free tier, we have free trial. We accumulated a large number of free users over the years. So with that type of situation, uh, where I start is actually, I begin to look at all the free users understand the behavior, instrument some tracking to, so that I can understand the usage data, getting some indicators like what type of usage contribute to activation, contribute to conversion, building up that up. Like I can already start understanding behavior, building up the conversion funnel and make an impact already. But when I work as an advisor, I talk with many more companies and many of them are in sales motion, they want to do PLG, but the where they are starting is totally different. They may came from a more traditional, like a B2B background, and the company doesn't even have a free version or free tier. Like if you go to some of the B2B uh, product website, you see a big book a demo call to action. That's the only call to action they have or contact sales, right? In those cases, the first step is actually you need to take a step back and think, how do I um, open it up for the users? You need to have a vehicle for PLG to work. Either it's a free tier or it's a free trial. Those are the two common ones. There are some other ones, right? How, Like to Lauren's point, how do you have this vehicle for PLG to work? Build that up first. And that first step is not easy for many companies, like from people I talk with, um, if has historically it has been very sales-driven, many companies have this fear of opening things up. Like, I don't want to open my free trial up to people not in my kind of uh, ICP, right? They are not my ideal customer profile. I don't want to do that. I, I, I don't want to get a bunch of things flooded in and they're not a good, good fit. So there is some culture elements even there to, to get started, to push through. And then there is also um, the infrastructure piece. Like um, we talk about what are the common challenges. One of the big challenge I observe in B2B companies is that because historically they are so sales-led, sales-driven, they don't have the need um, to build a solid data foundation to understand which features are used by the customer because you sell to a big customer, they don't get to use your product ahead of time. You convince them once they sign a contract, the deal is done. Like they, they probably paid for a year or multi-year contract, right? So the need of understanding usage behavior is much less compared to in a, B2, uh, into, in a PLG setting. You are giving away your free product. You're allowing users to use them you observe that and you try to find signal, right? To, to kind of design a journey, design the, design the experience so that you can activate and convert them. A lot of B2B companies, I joke, the, the data and infrastructure is like in kindergarten level compared to B2C companies because they have historically have been needing to do that. So that's often a big challenge. Um, the other challenge, as I mentioned, there is a culture element. If you have a very established sales and marketing team, their entire workflow is built around getting top of funnel, uh, getting leads, nurture them to MQL, hand it to sales, sales close them. Like that's basically the in existing workflow. Um, when you're introducing a PLG components, there are a lot of fear and questions in people's head. How does that impact my work? Does it take away my quota? Does it, this make my work less important? So there's a lot of education and kind of alignment need to happen as well. And 
Uh, other than infrastructure, culture, the third thing I will add is lack of expertise. Like you, you just don't know, right? Your team have been working this way. PLG is fairly new. Um, how do you find people or how do you get access to this type of expertise to help you make sure you don't make mistakes that can be easily avoided? Um, yeah, I, I think there are the things I can think of. Anything you want to add there, Lauren? No, I really liked what you said. I think your piece on, on data infrastructure is so important. Um, and, you know, I saw that there were some questions starting to trickle in and that some companies, you know, not necessarily are, are figuring out PLG after they already have a, a sales team, but might be figuring this out at the very beginning. And in that case, you have the opportunity to set these norms up front, which is a great luxury where you can invest in the data infrastructure. You can create a signup flow. You can think about a free experience or even a self-serve paid experience when you're launching. And um, that's that's a great thing to do up front. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you want to introduce this later that you can't, you just need to be thoughtful about the changes. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I have a question for you. I think you you actually have the luxury to work in great companies, right? They are very PLG um, focused. They have the culture red from the very beginning. So um, what like what do you see as some of the biggest opportunity areas in PLG. And once you work on it, how do you know whether it's working or not? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, well, you know, I think the opportunity if you're pursuing PLG for your company or product um, is efficiency. Sometimes I hear um, folks excited about PLG talking about it as something that will solve all of our growth problems, something that will make the business grow. Um, ultimately, the most important thing is that you have an awesome product with market fit. So keep in mind that PLG is a go-to-market strategy that can help make that product successful, um, but the product and the product experience and giving your customers something they find value in is, is really, really important is always the foundation. Um, in terms of opportunities for where, you know, I think where PLG can be impactful and sort of where it's growing or emerging right now. Um, one trend that I'm seeing is a reinvestment in onboarding and activation. So what I mean by activation is that initial getting started where someone who's signed up for a product in a product-led way is giving a product a try and gets to their aha moment or reaches that value that makes them develop a habit and stick around. Um, onboarding is an area where there have been a lot of tools that you can leverage, the Pendos or WalkMe's. Um, you know, you can sort of leverage a tool to help show people what to do, give them tips, point them around the product. But I'm seeing a new wave where tools are emerging that are more developer focused or that can enable you to build a more customized onboarding experience and that you can do that at a fraction of the time that you might have done in the past, building something really bespoke where you're teaching someone how to get started. So if you're pursuing PLG, I would keep that in mind and do your homework on what third-party tools you might be able to leverage to build that onboarding quickly and build some support for your customers so that they can sort of get started and build those initial habits faster and get to that aha moment. Um, the other area that I'm seeing emerge as a really interesting space for PLG is sales handoff or sales enablement. So bridging to something you mentioned earlier, that bridging from that free experience or product-led experience into that B2B or sales-led experience or enterprise experience. And you don't necessarily need to be selling to enterprises. It could be your business experience, but depending on the customer segments that you serve, that sales-assisted experience on the other side. And what I'm seeing there is actually leveraging the growth mindset and the folks who are expert in PLG to figure out who are the right leads to talk to. Who might want to talk to sales tomorrow? How can I help facilitate that initial conversation with someone on the sales team? What should our sales rep talk to the customer about? What data can we give them to give them the insights or the tools to have a productive conversation and help that customer ultimately find that contract or that deal where your more expensive offerings or more premium offerings are really appealing to the customer? So that's an area that I think is a little bit um, emerging or even yeah. underinvested in in PLG. Yeah. I'm excited to see where it goes. Yeah, definitely. I, I love you You touch upon that because sometimes I feel like people have this mindset of PLG purist, 
right? If we're product led, we cannot have sales team. And that's just not, not right because for B2B business, when the deal is big, right? Especially if you are dealing with large enterprise customers, their buying journey is different. It's unrealistic to expect you can rely on this free product experience to sell a hundred million deal at all, right? So you really, like I really think about um, product-led growth or like the sales touch, human touch or marketing nurture, like marketing campaigns. Those are all tools in your toolbox. And you should design ideally a customer journey and leverage all of this to help make the final conversion happen or retention or happy customer rather than saying, I have to do this. I cannot do that. I like that. That's, that's just, I feel like it's a, a some, something I hear people maybe uh, made mistake uh, sometimes. And I absolutely agree the focus on activation and onboarding. It's commonly, consistently one of the areas I work with my uh, advisory clients first, because it is a bridge between you getting customer into the door, right? You get them, but many cases I observe 90% of users don't use anything. They left the next day, right? What's the good? Then you, you did all the effort on marketing, get them there. Uh, and then if you make activation right, um, their retention, their conversion will follow. Their like their uh, qualification into PQL will follow. So it's a, such a critical area there as well. Um, and one thing I also saw people or companies tend to ignore is maybe they when they think about aha moments for B two B B two B customers, they oversimplify. Right? They think about Facebook's idea of um, ten friends in seven days, which is great. But for B2B product, usually it's more complex than that. Than that. I, I think about usually there are at least four different aha moments for different personas. There is the individual user, like I'm starting using Airtable. I love it today, right? And then there is the team aha moments. I'm, I love it so much. I invited a team member of mine. We collaborate on something together. We achieve something like valuable in terms of productivity gain or efficiency or workflow. That's the team aha moments. And then how do this get elevated to the decision maker, the buyer, like the head of IT, the CTO? Um, there is the buyer aha moment. He needs to be convinced of the ROI. And once this customer may be purchased, there is the paid customer aha moment. They need to see, I'm spending all this money and my team using it. Do I have enough utilization? Like there, the aha moments is just ongoing. Like the onboarding activation is almost not just new users. It's on continuous onboarding, continuous activation. So that's why it's super critical for, for B2B companies. I love that point. I I'm going to summarize it back to you because I think it's so important that maybe there isn't just one activation moment yeah. and that there is an account journey or a customer journey that you should map out and be open-minded that the foundation of PLG and of being product-led can support you in that user activation moment or that team activation moment, decision maker or beyond. Really, really like that point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I saw we have 71 questions coming already. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to try to maybe group some of them together and we can try to get to uh, as many of them as quickly. Um, let's say, um, I think I have, I really love this question from Claire. Is a hybrid motion that incorporate both PLG and SLG valuable? I, I saw a couple of similar questions. What is your take on that, or Lauren? Ooh, well, I actually was um, thinking to myself that you said some of this really well earlier. So I'll do my best to summarize, but I can't take credit. This is really from Hila's brain. Uh, I really agree. I think there is so much value in choosing early in your product's lifetime, whether you want to be predominantly product-led or sales-led in your go-to-market. However, in most cases where PLG is possible and feasible and effective for your product, you should ultimately aim to have both working together. And the question to ask is how do we bridge from one to the other? How do we make these two go-to-market motions complement each other? And how do we let the product help us lead in that sales-led motion and also help us generate stickier and more powerful use from our customers, even when they're working with our sales team. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think ultimately 
like if I look at all the super successful companies, it's a layering game. It's not like have to choose one, right? If you think about Airtable or um, Figma, a lot of the more PLG kind of emergent companies, they started from PLG, like have a solid foundation with data, with experimentation, with onboarding, all of that. But they all have sales team, right? They all have sales team because at certain point they realize that you need to have sales team to cater to the enterprise buying journey. And you need to sales, you need to have sales team to drive the bigger deals. And there is a bridge between the two, as you mentioned, which is you can still use your product to uh, reach a broad set of users to activate them. And you can use data to find signal within those usage, right? Map, maybe there are a, a, a emergent usage, a bucket of usage from the same enterprise company that actually on this product, that signal, that data can be leveraged to uh, send to the sales team to help them close the bigger deal. So I think that's this direction. I also definitely saw the other direction where um, companies used to be sales-led, like a little bit GitLab's case, right? And also HubSpot, which is a very kind of classic example. The company started with sales-led, they are very successful, but they added a PLG motion later on because they realized that if they don't disrupt themselves, there will be new coming, newcomers disrupting them, right? Rather than to wait for that to happen, they want to add this motion. That this motion can defend themselves, give them a broader reach to users, increase the efficiency. Um, it's not easy, but they they did it. Like I definitely saw many other enterprise B2B companies, they are either um, experimenting something internally with a new product they acquired, or um, they are just trying something, trying to est establish this PLG muscle internally because they want to get ahead of the competitions in, in the space. So I think ultimately it's a layering game. Where you start might be different, might be tied to like, with, with, with who you are as a company and as a product. Um, yeah, I think oh. that's, a, that's, a, that's a great one. Um, I like this one today. Um, let's see, a question from Tony Yang. I'd love to hear where were some examples of the main growth levers uh, and successes that both of you saw at Airtable and Gillab? Like what are some wins or levers you saw at your time at Airtable? Ooh, this is a good one. So for folks who are on the call who use Airtable, you'll be familiar with Airtable forms. If you're not familiar with Airtable, it's a no-code, low-code platform for building apps and building workflows. And one of the simplest things you can do in building apps or workflows on Airtable is create a form. Uh, something that's really nice about our forms product is you can sort of sort and manipulate the data afterward. But the point is that we have a cool forms product like, like many products do. And what we discovered is that Airtable forms were a really awesome entry point for people who hadn't learned about Airtable yet or hadn't learned what it was because they gave us virality from one Airtable user to many form submitters. They gave us a branding moment where those people filling out that form would see an Airtable logo or would say, hey, this is cool. I really like this experience. Maybe I can make a form here. We also more recently have enabled some features that we saw in the market that we knew were gonna be really helpful for people using our forms. So you can request a receipt or a copy of what you submitted, or you can capture who submitted the form. Basic things that a lot of us really value when we're using products like that. What we found is that the form loop was a viral loop for us and an acquisition loop that was starting to show a lot of promise pretty early on. And over time, we leaned into optimizing and making that loop more effective and it ended up driving a ton of new traffic for us in a really contextual way. Um, what I like about the forms loop is that if you're thinking about product-led growth, making something, some feature, some surface in your product accessible to non-users or non-customers as a moment of exposure to say, hey, there's a really cool product that you might be able to find value in has been really cool for us. And even though Airtable is now nine years old, we're still finding all this low-hanging fruit there, which I think is a testament to um, you know, what kind of value you can get from leaning into one of those product-led loops and optimizing it over time. Um, yeah. Hila, tell me about one on your side. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I 100% agree. I feel like 
um, for, for GitLab, as I mentioned, it's a, a little bit different, right? We started more sales led So there are a lot of low hanging fruits. I also need to build a lot of infrastructure. Like we, we, we are almost like building infrastructure, getting usage data, getting insight, while also trying to do experimentation and getting results. Um, so something I did at GitLab and also something I typically do with my advisory clients is do a full funnel audit of the new user experience, starting from the marketing side, uh, going to the sign up flow, going to the onboarding experience, and also looking into the, the kind of the lifecycle marketing side of things, as well as eventually the PQL, right, the conversion journey uh, and the self-service checkout flow. So whenever I do that full funnel audit, there are always tons of low hanging fruits. Like for example, um, the, the sign up flow can be simplified or you can add a few questions to give you valuable insights um, that you can use for either PQL or customized onboarding. And for onboarding, we had a bunch of success at GitLab as well. Initially, I was like, I was concerned because I felt like GitLab is a developer product. Developers are super smart. They don't like to be hand-holding. They don't like to be kind of sell to or market to, right? Um, they, they just are very sensitive to that. Um, but we, we still feel like there probably are some help we can provide for the beginners, for the new users. So we uh, launched something called the Learn GitLab experience, where we provide you some guidance um, for the new, new beginners. Um, we were suspicious. I was suspicious whether it will work or not, because I was like, they, they don't like this, but it worked. And we also have um, users and developers in Twitter kind of saying thank you for us to us for that. Like for us new in this space, it provides valuable guidance. So um, I think that's one big learning, like developers, marketers, um, sales team, we are all different, but in the end of the day, we're all human. So there are a lot of things that's common that like for 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 new things we need to learn, right? For kind of um experiences flow, make it easy, don't make me think. So there are a lot of actually uh, low hanging fruits I was able to find in that full funnel journey. And the other thing I would add is if you are trying to start kind of a PLG in a sales motion or implement things like PQL, product qualified leads, um, building strong relationship with your sales team. Like they are the most, probably a very influential team in B2B, in any B2B company and your most important ally. So the moment we begin to send PQL, send some usage data, send some new leads to Salesforce, the interest and the support from sales team jumps through the roof. Uh, before they were like, oh, okay, the growth team is just working on some things. Why does it matter to me? But after that, it totally changes. So I think think about the al alignment, think about your allies is also very important in this journey as well. Can I ask a follow-up? I saw some, yeah. some questions related to sort of getting started yeah. with PLG and you mentioned this educational experience it was a really big win. But um, it can be hard to prioritize an investment like that if you're just getting started because yeah. it was probably a lot of work for the team. And also, in some cases, you might not have sort of the experimentation infrastructure or all of the data that you need to know that this is going to be a good investment of time. So can you share a little bit about how to think about getting started and making sure that an investment like that is worth the time and gets prioritized? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I had to deal with that a lot. Like at GitLab, I don't have great infrastructure in the beginning. At my previous company, Acorns, we have some infrastructure, but like nobody's doing experimentation or, or growth type of stuff. I always try to think of a couple of things. First of all, um, your early wins are critical. When you are new at a company, when you are trying to um, build a momentum around PLG or growth, it's important you have some early wins in your belts. How do you get to that? Is you need to really build strong conviction before you uh, get to testing or get to do anything. So at Acorns, as an example, I was new. Uh, I saw there are some opportunity in the onboarding and registration flow, but um, how I get to that is actually I talk with a lot of existing team members and understand from their perspective, where do you see as a missed opportunity? Like maybe you see there's potential here. 
And a lot of them point to a similar direction. And with that, I then did some quick data analysis and user research. And all of those point kind of backed up that, that direction. And with this strong conviction, I was able to um, find some resources uh, in engineer team and just make something really small. Like we did a copy test as the first experiment, but in the area, I know that's a strategic longer term direction. And the first experiment was super successful and that make like everything after that super easy. So the first advice I will give is build conviction, trying to do lightweight things to, to uh, have a really strong hypothesis. And then that'll make, get a quick win, that'll make things easy. The other thing I would say, um, I always felt like growth or product-led growth is as much as about insights and data and experimentation. Um, I always felt like growth team has two purposes. One is generate impact, impacts, generate wins. The other one is generate insights and just educate people about the behavior, the usage, how to use data. Um, and when you do that, people follow you, people believe you. Like at GitLab, I launched this thing called Win or Learn, like a monthly brief. And we just summarize all the insights we are able to get from research, from data, as well as the winners, and as well as the learnings from failed experiments. And we distribute that kind of across the company. That really gave me a lot of grassroots kind of support. Like one time someone from sales team reached out and say, oh, this is really cool. I never know you can do things like this way. And next time I was going to do a experiment involve sales team, I just find that person and he made an intro and it makes things easier. I felt like that's a very important component as well. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Lauren. I think uh, I saw a question actually, let's say, uh, from, uh, from um, let's say, there is a question around tooling. Like, what do you see as, I know you're a big kind of PLG2 uh, nerd uh, as well. You have a lot of knowledge. Like, what are some toolings like Gainsight or Pendo or, or things like that that can make things easier? And what are the purposes that those tools kind of serve? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you a few from a couple different areas. Um, there are a lot out there. So don't consider this an exhaustive list, but maybe a starting point to see what you can find. Um, one company that I'm really excited about that I think references something I brought up earlier, onboarding, and sort of how that's evolving is called DOPT, which is spelled D-O-P-T. Mm -hmm. And they are building a, sort of a Pendo competitor, um, but it's developer first. It's built with developers in mind. Nice. So you can really quickly and easily customize and deploy onboarding in a way that I haven't seen before in the market, which means that companies that are much earlier in PLG or maybe much smaller with leaner engineering resources can have onboarding experiences that look a lot more like what mature companies are putting forward, like Airtable or even public companies. So um, that's definitely one to check out on the onboarding front. Um, there are a number of really interesting tools to support with that wins or learnings that you alluded to. One mm -hmm. that I'm learning a bit about right now actually is called EPO. EPPO, mm -hmm. and they're working on experimentation tooling and making it more accessible for earlier stage companies that want to make sure they're capturing those learnings. Um, and then there are multiple tools, actually, that are really helping with what you might have heard as the buzzword of product-led sales. And that's harvesting those insights and that data to figure out who are the right leads in your product-led or free or freemium experience for your sales team to talk to. And that's a really awesome way to actually help prove value to your partners in sales and success teams, um, helping to get a tool like Pocus or uh, Endgame, I believe is another yeah. one. Um, get one of those tools. Pays. Exactly. There are many of them. Exactly, there's a bunch of them. And, and that's a really great way, especially in the, an earlier stage startup to start getting to those insights and those learnings without feeling like you need to build it all yourself. Um, Hila, you've probably seen seen a few more that I haven't that I haven't yeah. mentioned. Yeah, definitely. I think I, I I think there are actually two categories. One I call them more like PLG infra, because without those it wouldn't work. So let let's what I mentioned, right? You need a data infrastructure. You need a um, some sort of a product experimentation to Apple falls into that or is optimizely and something else. 
you need a life cycle marketing tool. Many companies, right, they, when they start, they have a, if, especially if they start from sales motion, they have a traditional lead nurturing tool, but they don't have a life cycle marketing tool. So like things like HubSpot can do some of this. Braze is a great one. Customer, customer.io is a, is a commonly used one here as well. And, um, and then you need a product analytics tool, right? The, the amplitude, the mix panel, pendle, things like that. And then under, underneath that, you need to build a customer database, right? The, or whether it's through a, your own data warehouse or CDP, um, like segment and particle amplitude has that. There are also some ETL tool and reverse ETL tool to kind of have the data pipeline um, build quickly as well. So without that data piece, a lot of the tools wouldn't be as efficient. I think that's a, that's a one thing I would add there. And then there, the second category is the tool stack. A lot of the tools we talk about fall there. Um, I think something interesting, I definitely, I feel like probably most B2B companies use uh, this, but the data in, in, enrichment tool is important when you are trying to bridge the gap between user usage to company, right? To find a buyer, decision maker, things like Clearbit, Zoom Info, you need that database in order to even make that mapping. And uh, um, I definitely think there are the, um, um, the user onboarding tool, you mentioned a couple of them. Um, there are actually an emerging category of I would say monetization platform. I think that's really cool, right? There, there, there. For example, you have the traditional payment solution like Stripe, but in order to make PLG work, you really want to make the self-service checkout experience very streamlined. So there is a solution called Checkout.com, which actually can dynamically compare multiple payment. Uh, solutions and pick the best one for this country that this user is from. I, I saw that's really cool. There are some other um, tools like sales breaks that allow you to do some custom customization of your, your sales quota and things like that. That's really cool as well. So yeah, it's definitely a very exciting space. So many things are happening um, in this space here. Yeah. Awesome. Um, um, I saw a question that came up a couple times, if I can uh -huh. ask you. Yeah, um, which is how do you how do you do this PLG thing in your organization or specifically, you know, what's the PLG team? Who are those people working on it? How do you yeah. structure it and, and what does success look like? Yeah, that's a such a great question. And I got asked that a lot. And because everyone is confused and every company has a different PLG team structure, the name is different, where the city is different. Um, I think I, I try to think about this in phases, right? The first phase is when you get when you are getting started. I think the common way I saw PLG get started is you assemble a dedicated growth team. Like that's the case at GitLab. We hired this growth team, we have a couple of growth PMs, we have analytics, we have supported engineers and designers. That's how you can get started. The other way I saw companies get started is have a cross-functional tiger team. This is important, especially if you want to address an important cross-functional uh, initiative like PQL. If you want to work on PQL, product qualified leads, it's not just a product initiative, right? You need to have a, a sales counterparts that can take the PQL. You, you need to think about how this work with the existing marketing workflow. So in those cases, have a small cross-functional tiger team, have people from product slash growth, uh, marketing, sales, um, and they can work on that. So that's how you get started, either a dedicated growth team or a cross-functional tiger team. And then when it become a little bit more formal, right? When you prove this can work in my company for my product, um, I think the two most common structure I saw is, um, I would say, usually the head of growth will sit in the product organization. I believe that's the case for Airtable. That was the case at GitLab as well, because how we work, we are like, we are, we work as a product team. We just focus on maybe slightly different KPIs and experiences. Uh, I would say um, the KPIs my team own at GitLab, we, we own free to paid conversion rate, we own activation rate. Later, we added PQLs in that uh, there as well. Um, and then the other setup is, I do see occasionally the head of growth will report to the 
sales slash marketing slash GTM organization because think about they are working on a, another funnel in addition to the sales funnel, the, the marketing sales funnel, right? So it's easier if you have that set up, the KPIs are more aligned and maybe the head of growth will own the self-service revenue and the rest of the, the sales org own the kind of the enterprise or, or uh, mid-market revenue. So that's another way. Um, what do you think? Like, I, I'm sure you see things probably different or similar in, in that case. Yeah, I resonate with a lot of what you said. I think, uh, you know, you did mention how Airtable is structured. That's correct. As the head of growth, I'm a head of product growth. So I report into our chief product officer, though it can vary based on the company. And in my peer set and in the head of growth community that's operating today, I am seeing that that product lineage is the most common. But of course, that usually happens at a bit of a later stage. Um, one additional thing that I'll add is if you're a brand new startup, if you just launched in, you know, in the past year or are launching soon, um, growth can be done with an individual and with the right culture and mindset. Um, having a dedicated growth team is something that I see happen a little bit later, maybe between series A and C, and then having multiple growth teams happens even later than that. So Airtable's growth org with multiple teams was started to build out at series D. Um, the reason I share that is if you're thinking about how much to invest in growth or, oh, we need to hire a bunch of growth people, you can be lean with your resources. And I think a great growth practitioner is always doing the math on getting that business return on how many people they hire. So be scrappy and sort of get started with a small proof of concept with a person or a couple people or a small team. And then you can always invest more and grow that out over time. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I saw an interesting question. I think um, Yuki asked, which are the biggest mistakes when setting up a PLG in a company that already have a sales team? Or what are some common misconceptions about PLG? Like, how do you think about that one, Lauren? Oh, I have one for you here. So. <laughs> um, Here's a scenario that I've seen play, play out at, com at B2B companies that start with sales-led and want to become product-led. Um, the company is, is primarily using sales as their go-to-market, and you must chat with sales in order to start using the product and you know, officially become a customer. So it's fully sales-led. And then something is noticed, which is that it can be pretty expensive to have a bunch of people in the sales support and success functions help a customer get started because there are many, many hours required across many humans. So a reaction that tends to follow there is, hey, well, what if we let people sign up and put their credit card in and just get started on our website so that they didn't have to talk to sales? Because then we might be able to save a lot of time. You know, we wouldn't have to talk to the customer. They wouldn't have to talk to us. Maybe that would be more efficient. And then the, the company proceeds to build what you would call sort of a no-touch checkout or, you know, the ability to sign up and get started without necessarily having to talk all that much to the customer teams. Um, here is why I think that can be sort of a, an assumption that is incorrect or sort of something that is a misconception about how PLG works. Um, it is not enough to create a sign-up or checkout flow. You must be thoughtful about if your customers will be able to be successful without talking to your customer teams and also if they really want to be able to sign up without talking to your customer teams. Sometimes I find a lot of engineering work goes into building these things and then you turn on that self-checkout flow and the reality is that most of those customers have a lot of questions and they'd rather just get on the phone with you anyway. So I would be really thoughtful about exactly which customer pain points you think you can address in building out that PLG motion and ensuring that the product and also the onboarding flow are well suited to not having to chat with sales or chat with folks on your support or success teams so that you get enough of that efficiency gain that it was worth the investment. Yeah, that's a, such a good one. Like building a self-service checkout flow doesn't equal PLG basically, right? Um, I think the other one I saw is um, if you have a sales team, right? You are trying to layer on PLG, there inherently there are some conflict and there can be some tension in that relationship. There are things you can do to help with that. One example will be, think about designing the sales quota and sales incentives in a way to 
minimize that conflict, right? Rather than making it like the self-service is taking away revenue or quota or success from sales team. Uh, I saw many successful uh, companies, Larry and PLG, they actually changed the sales incentive to be more focused on the expansion, right? Like you, you don't, you, you don't want to incentivize them trying to sell a, such a big contract upfront, but you incentivize them have PLG to land on the initial customer because it's more efficient. It is called uh, it's more kind of lower cost. Um, but you incentivize the sales team to work on the expansion. They can still get the revenue, the growth, the, the quota, but just work on those type of structure. I think that's definitely one. The other one I saw is that um, pricing is an interesting piece in the whole PLG kind of discussion, right? When you are sales motion, you can negotiate, like you talk with your customer, right? There, there can be a conversation, but if you are doing PLG, pricing is so critical. Sometimes your conversion is low. The PLG, you, you, you're like, oh, PLG doesn't work, but it's maybe not because of other things. It's because your pricing is not set up right. Either it's too high of a jump or your free tier is too good. Like nobody need the kind of upgrade to a higher tier um, at all. There's no motivation. So I think that's another one I saw a, a lot as well. Yeah. Um, let's see, we may we may have time for last two or, or last one question. This is like overwhelming. We have 122 questions. How can we get all of them? Uh, all of them, but um, let's see. Uh, any anything anything good you saw, Lauren? Okay, here's one. Uh -huh. um, products in B two B companies have been around for a really long time. PLG is hot and trendy right now. Why is that? What do we think is sort of causing this trend? And is there any advice that mm -hmm. we would give to make sure that you're pursuing it with uh, you know the best interests of your company in mind yeah that's 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 such a great question um I think the fundamental reason I saw is that um end users like me like I'm a I'm an end user of a uh, airtable right I and my company may purchase airtable but I may actually get to use airtable in my own personal project at certain time and um I become much more important as a driving force in the B2B software buying cycle as well, right? Like I, I definitely saw at GitLab, we saw this a lot. A lot of times our sales team will um, say, this customer reached out to me and they, they, they this, this kind of, we have an advocate in this company, he used GitLab in his personal project and they use GitLab in his previous work. Now they're ready to, um, evaluate a solution, they use the free version, they did the proof of concept on their own, they're ready to buy, they just call me and they, they just say, hey, can you help me close this contract? So the buying process or the, or the buying journey is different. The end individual end user play a much bigger role. And because as a, an individual end user, I'm used to try before I buy. I want to use things. I never uh, need to download a B2C app and talked with the sales and then kind of begin to use the product. So I'm much used to this journey. I play a much bigger role. Um, I think fundamentally that's one of the biggest reason why this is happening. I, I, I totally agree. There's, there's another thing that's on my mind here, which is looking ahead. So we all know there have been better market conditions than there are right now. And I'm seeing a shift in the industry from growth at all costs to efficient growth. And what that means is when you can help accelerate customers through your account journey and to premium value and use of your product in more efficient ways, that is very attractive for the long-term durable growth of your company. So looking ahead, if you're getting started on something new, on a new product, on a new company, PLG, if it works for your business, can be a way to enable that efficient growth, which is especially attractive when we're in tougher market conditions and when uh, it's important to be smart about hiring and sort of setting up your team for success. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I saw something kind of interesting. Let's say, um, how do you think about freemium 
free trial, reverse free trial, like like that is a I know it's a topic dear and near to your heart. Like, how do you think about those different options to get new users started? Yes, yes. So um, there is not a golden answer. As you know, many companies do this differently. Um, you can offer a free plan. You can offer a free trial. So you can trial the product for free, but ultimately we only offer paid usage. Or you can do something in between, which is called a reverse trial, which is what Airtable does. So we provide a trial of our premium offerings, but you can still use the free product later if you want to use the free product over time. And we will offer that as well. Um, Fundamentally, I think the most important question to ask here is what is more important to us as a business right now and over the short to medium term? Is it user growth or is it revenue growth? In the case of Airtable with a reverse trial, we are deliberate in wanting as many people as possible to experience the full value of Airtable in user growth, in getting every household to find a way to benefit from and take advantage of the awesome stuff Airtable offers for their hobbies, for their personal projects. So we're very generous. We give you a free trial of premium stuff, but if you wanna keep using our free plan forever, that's accessible to you as well. Mm -hmm. I think in a different business where you're most focused on premium usage, maybe some of the dynamics of the business you're building, compute costs, you know, there could be other costs that are fixed would require you to ask customers to pay most, if not all of the time, then maybe a reverse trial or a free plan don't make as much sense. But that's where I would start the conversation on which is more important to you and then go from there. Um, yeah. And Hila, do you want to close out and tell me what you think about that? This is a great topic. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I would definitely say um, reverse trial is a kind of, you get a benefit of both freemium and the, the free, free trial a little bit together. Um, I absolutely agree with your point around thinking about cost. Like for GitLab, we actually have a cost when you are a free user using a lot of our features. We have hosting costs, traffic costs, a lot of that. So for us, we need to be much more um, sensitive around how to design the experience because there is a trade-off between the cost to serve and the benefit of getting more free users. And also we have a uh, we have a challenge. Many uh, many developer tool product and many product has a challenge of fraud. So you when you when you make things super easy, you attract more fraud. Try to abuse your plat pl 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 platform as well. So there is many things to balance there. Um, but overall, I absolutely agree with your assessment. Uh, free free tier is great for attracting a lot of users. Limited free trial is a great way to increase um, the conversion near term. And the reverse trial kind of combines the benefit of two. Um, so with that, we are at time. I cannot believe we only answered like five questions. I feel like, uh, I felt so bad. But um, if any of you want to keep in touch with us, I know Lauren is very open. I'm very open as well. You can find us on LinkedIn. Shoot us a message. We, we will try to answer uh, some of the questions um, possible as well. But um, thank you, everyone, for, for kind of joining us today. Thank you so much. This was so fun, and we hope you found it helpful. Yeah. Bye, everyone.